essence and everyone that knows me is safety first. Mm -hmm. I wish that somebody clearly, and I'm very happy about that FAA's trust test, Mm -hmm. is that somebody clearly, because this didn't used to even exist, explain to me the emergency and safety functions that are built in within the DJI drone, but also that me as an operator, so there's two safety functions. There's the ones that are, yes, in the drone. There's multiple, as you know, DJI Mm -hmm. safety functions. And I just wish somebody had clearly explained those to me and how they work. Because if you know those and you know how to actually have a little practical experience doing it, plus me as a pilot, you know, your the, the visuals and the other weather checks, you know, the things I can do. If I knew those two sets of safety procedures, and that's what I tell my students, if you do those, your chances of crashing or losing your drone are extremely Oh my gosh, so small. Like if you understand the safety, DJI does so much for you. And I feel mm. like nobody knows. Actually, I'm curious, what's your favorite safety setting or the one that you think is most helpful for your students? knowing how to engage and disengage return to home. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Know it exists on there. And then when I do it, so like when I'm doing training, either I have them, you know, engage or disengage, or I have them engage it when they are less than 20 meters from the home point, Mm -hmm. because if they engage it closer than that, it auto lands, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. freaks people out. But, you know, um, understanding how to engage and disengage that, that's like one. Or that when it is returning to calm, not to touch the darn sticks. If you can't see that drone, you need to trust the technology. If you were in that much of a pinch that you had to engage, return to home, because you couldn't find your drone. You're that joker. It's like, ah, and you're freaking out and you have to do it. Then you just let go of those sticks and you chill out and you trust that technology is going to do what it needs to do. Because what people don't realize is when it's returning to home, if you start freaking out and start pushing the sticks, Mm -hmm. the drone, you still have control of the drone. Yeah. You still have control. You can turn it. You can make it go up and down. And if you don't see it and it's coming home and you start messing with it, you can push it right into a building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it's returning, if you don't see it. And I don't even, I tell them to don't even disengage it. If they're that freaked out, because typically if you're engaging it, you're like in that shaky mode, Christine. You know how it is. Mm-hmm. You have a close one and you're just like, I just want to land this drone <laughs> and breathe. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, at that point, you know, maybe auto land it. And, you know, you know, you can land it, but you're like a little shaky. So like, just do it and, and catch yourself, you know. That's and a so great one. in that mode, you've got to be calm. So like a lot of things I, I call my drone because I do. First of all, with my, my trainees, they're usually a longer term program. So I'll do like a one week boot camp, I call it, where we go out there and I always tell them, where's the windiest place? Where's the worst place? Where's this place? I want every emergency to happen. Mm-hmm. Where's the big utility towers? Let's f- launch it next to the mm-hmm. cell tower, see if we can get some interference because mm-hmm. I want them to see the warnings. Yes. I want them to go down into the marinas oh. and try to get electromagnetic when I'm there. Because I, I, I love I that. I'm off on their own and to them to come into some new experience. I so agree. It's like a boot camp. And then I do a longer term, like where I'm their coach because they're setting up and they're implementing a mapping strategy, a monitoring strategy, how to, as you know, data management, all this media, mm-hmm. all this data. And then we're uploading it and creating like mapping data too. So we have double data. It, it's, if you know how it is, if you, there is a lot, hold on. Let me add to your, your safety setting from before. Cause I think this is really important. Auto return to home is something that everyone needs to understand how it works because you are like, you're talking about using it when you're freaking out and you need to let your drone do its thing. But the one I would add is I'm always updating my auto return to home height before I go fly. Oh, yeah, because yeah. if your auto return height is set to the Maldives, which is like 30 feet, which is like the tallest palm tree around, right? Like the Maldives highest point. I don't know if you know this. It's like seven feet. <laughs> there's no. nothing. There's I wouldn't nothing there. to go there like in 20 years. Yeah. But, but your the- auto return to home for a city, right? In St. Pete, Florida, for example, you got to clear those buildings. Like it's probably like two at the lowest, like 240 feet, but yeah. some of those buildings wow. are pretty tall. So you gotta, you gotta change that return to home height. 
But I think another newbie ex like problem is like people think, okay, auto return to home. I'm going to set it at the highest type. It's always going to be, because I always talk in mm -hmm. meters, 120, 120. And I'm like, no, you guys, that's like the dumbest thing because usually you're engaging that because battery's low yeah. or there's some other critical mission. Oh, it and takes time like, to get out of there. there. <laughs> You don't want it to go up and then it spins around and then it, mm -hmm. you know how it is. It sucks way more battery and automate any automated mission. Especially if there's wind that day. Now it's flying oh. back to you at the highest height with a ton of wind and that ain't good either. Okay, all right. Welcome to the drone party. Drones are so fun. And in this podcast, we are highlighting the stories of drone pilots with their helpful tips to help you be a better and inspired pilot. And we're also keeping it real. We're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. But if you're new here, welcome. I'm your host, Christine Lozada. I love drones. Today's guest is someone who uses her drones a little bit differently than who you might normally see on this podcast. She's a marine biologist. She does a lot of mapping. So let's introduce Kim. Well, I guess you could say my name's Kim Baldwin. I'm from San Diego, grew up here, born and raised Californian to the bone, but I moved over 20 years ago to the Caribbean. Um, I'm also a marine biologist. So I am Caribbean Kim too, and Cali Kim. <laughs> Depends which group of friends you're in, <laughs> um, what you call me, or I'm Dr. Kim to all my students, um, or just Kimmy, Kimmy B. Everybody calls me different things. I don't really go by Dr. Kim, but, you know, formal times. Um, but yeah, born and raised here, lived 20 years in the Caribbean. I'm a marine biologist. And as I mentioned, I just started flying drones, not because I was some geeky girl or even a photographer. I started flying drones as a tool for my job. It all of a sudden was this game. I knew it was going to be a game changer. I was working in 3D mapping and modeling of the environment. And it was just like, I had to learn. That. How long have you been flying for? And what do you mostly fly? Or what are you currently flying now? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great question. I've been flying since 2015, like the Christmas of 2015. So myself and two brothers of mine, one's a YouTuber, one's a um, surf photographer. We all got drones at the same time, but they were boys <laughs> who played video games their whole lives and I wasn't. So that was like Christmas of 2015. Um, it was like Phantom 3s and wow. they were much harder <laughs> than they are today. There's a lot of sketchy things um, with that drone. So I've been flying since then. I knew I've been doing, as I've told you before, GIS and using satellite imagery and aerial pictures for my job as a marine biologist for 15 years. I so um, I'd been using aerial pictures, using satellite imagery. So like, again, like 2014, 2015, when commercial drones started getting on the scene at a really reasonable price point. And I realized I could because I was working in the, I am working in the Caribbean. We didn't have a lot of money. So to get satellite imagery, it was like very low resolution. The pixels were 30 meters by 30 meters. Wow. So you couldn't even see what's happening on the ground. Most of the islands, because as you know, they would have like a lot of mountains are covered in clouds in the middle. Mm -hmm. So even if you could get satellite imagery, two thirds of the island would be under cloud. And then, like I mentioned, it'd be really blocky you couldn't see anything and it was hand me down stuff that like other people gave you so it really wasn't the best quality so then when drones 1500 wow. maybe back then they were a little more maybe like two twenty five hundred dollars but mm -hmm, the fact mm -hmm. that i could actually have something for that price point that i could fly myself capture aerial images and do what i was doing which was environmental mapping working with communities working with other you know, nonprofits, small environmental groups, government agencies mapping what the environmental, the marine problems were, the issues were, the animals. And so then we had this tool now, which was a, like what I saw is this like remote control plane <laughs> <laughs> that my brother's like, I hated video games as a kid, like anti video games. Didn't okay, hold on. Let's double, t let's double click on that really quick. In your opinion, do you think people who are good at video games are therefore good at drones? Why or why not? 
Oh, I, I, Christine, I've, I've trained probably over <laughs> 500 people to fly drones. Okay. So, and I've trained actually more women than men to fly mm. drones. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, which I didn't realize till recently is such an odd thing. But, um, and I can tell you hands down, <laughs> gamers. I, so I it's would like, actually. Be like women agree. and men, and it'd be their first flight, Christine. And then, like, it'll be like some timid girl, and she comes up and she's like, he he, takes a remote and then kills it. And starts doing like figure eights on the first flight. Like, <laughs> and she was like, like, it's always the girl that waits to the very end. She's like the quiet one in the group. So and funny. then gets up there and kills it on her first flight. And I'm like, uh, every time. Or if it's a boy, what, too. What no, is are you it? a gamer? And it's always gamers. What is it about video games and drones do you think is helping someone? The control. The Stick controller. Control. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. It, that confidence that you, it's just like driving a car. As I tell people, learning to fly a drone is not like rocket scientists. Drones and cars, like it, it's the same sort of process. You got to get a license for both. You got to have experience, the more experience, the more confidence mm-hmm. you get, the more you fly. You don't even think about it. It's like hard sometimes when I've been flying on my own, like right now I got new drones and I'm out testing every day without students. Of course, <laughs> random people come up and I start teaching in the beach yeah, and whatever, yeah. but it, you know, and so I don't even think about it. So then when like next week, when I start training people again, I'll have to think about explaining this, as you know, the stick controls, like, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it's the right stick or push forward with the left. And it's like, I, because it's so second nature now, mm-hmm. it's sometimes, you know, if I, harder to describe it. I- I agree. And I would say one of the things is that a lot of people who fly drones with us are adults and they are people who do not like to fail. And there's nothing similar to flying a drone if you have not played video games. Like holding the controller in your hand and navigating with the sticks is not intuitive. But if you play video games and you're used to having that kind of hand-eye coordination in controlling something remotely, or mm-hmm. just, you know, pushing these buttons to be able to control something. It's a, it's definitely gives you a leg up. So I agree with that. Various drone story. Okay. Yeah. So I think it was day two. We got them like right before Christmas. So it was like, we waited, we all opened them on Christmas. We went to like a car park. We flew our first flights. Fine. Hold and on. Really I, I want to double click on that first flight. Like bring us back to that <laughs> day. What was it like? Because I'm also fascinated because yeah. and I mean, remember you're, who you're fine with. with your brothers. Yeah, you're Two fine brothers. with your brothers who will have confidence. And we know sibling rivalry. Mm-hmm. All right. So, yeah, it's like them. And then they're the gamers. They always grew up gaming, whatever. And they knew that I was just getting this drone for work. I'd been hired, actually, already by the Nature Conservancy to put on a drone training class in six months' time. They hired cool. me to develop a curriculum and develop a oh, class because I was already yes. training people to do the mapping. And I was like, you guys, I don't know. And they're like, oh, you'll be fine. You're smart. You'll figure it out, Kim. <laughs> and I was like, like, because I've been working with these nerds that have been doing it with satellite imagery and it like took them months. And I was like, you guys, you really think that like, you're fine. So like I kind of got forced into it. It wasn't something I was passionate about. And I was always scared. Mm. There's another point that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always scared. And I there's I wish I would have known. <laughs> what were you scared um, of? Crashing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't know. I'd never flown a remote control plane. I'd never. And they both had done it. They both grew up doing, you know, they had them as kids. They played video games. So I go out with them. We go to fly. We did the first day. It was great. Um, a little scary, you know. And But the P3 back then had a lot of, you had to do compass calibrations. There was a lot of mm-hmm, weird mm-hmm. things. The connection was not, I mean, it's nothing like the drones today. So anyhow, then day two, we go out, we hike up onto this mountain viewpoint area right by our house, the three of us. It's like cold, it's about sunset, we're flying. So we're doing them all separate and it's my turn. I get up there and I'm just like scared. Again, Back then, nobody was YouTubing on like how to fly drones. <laughs> yeah. You know, I read a few things in the DJ and so I'm up there. And so I started getting cocky. Like, yeah, I can fly. <laughs> and I'm like, doing double stick like that. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next thing I know, it's like sunset, right before sunset, like five o'clock. I do two control sticks to the center. Oh, I know what that yeah. does. And, and then back then, it didn't matter what altitude you were. It doesn't warn you. It automatically shut the blades off. Uh-huh. 
and the drone dropped wow. out of the sky. And all three of us at the same time were like, no. Oh my goodness. And, and they're like, you, I, we, we won't get into what they called me. Of all um, of the movements that you could yeah. do, the no, one and that turns off then. the well, blades. They, they changed it subsequently six months later that you can't do that anymore. Okay. And this was way back in 20, beginning of first quarter 2016. They, yeah. They changed the firmware on that because I obviously other people were doing it too, besides dummy here. Um, and, and I guess that again, if I was a gamer, I would have known that. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that. So it was awful. But then we learned a lot of great things that day because wait, what it, happened? So did it, it simply fall from the sky? Yeah, it was like 30 feet up from the ground. It oh, fell into all this California shrubland bush. Mm -hmm. But it was dense bush and there was no roads in. And we're like, oh my God. And we all saw generally where it went. So we hiked down there and it's like bush, you know, above our heads. And we don't have like machete oh, or cutlass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're like, oh. but then the sunset. And I love the black, oh. the flashing lights. Uh -huh. So we were able, this is before find my drone. They didn't have find my drone. But because of the flashing lights you and we still close to sunset, we saw immediately the flashing and then we went in, grabbed yes! it. Yes. Even the gimbal wasn't even broken. It was like. Hold on. Oh, let's, let's just recap anyway. this. California Kimmy drops a drone out of the sky by accidentally bringing the controls together, a Phantom 3, drops 30 feet into the California shrubbery, and you're able to find it because of the flashing lights, because it's dark outside now, or sunset time. That's amazing. I love that And story. the gimbal wasn't even broken. It was the best. And then you know what? That was my first drone. Of me and those two jokers of a brother I have, who is the only one that still has her P3 functional? <laughs> Today. You still have it. It's an oh, antique yeah. at this point. It That's training. amazing. I use it for training, Christine, because it has no obstacle avoidance. Yeah. You have to do calibrations every time. Mm -hmm. It's like the perfect trainer. That's I'm never getting rid of any I of my I use my drones. Mavic Mini 1 exactly for that reason. The gimbal is broken because I dropped it inside of the car. Like <laughs> I was too lazy to put it away into its, into its uh, um, holder, and I fell in the car. And I broke the gimbal of all ways to break that drone. Um, I love that you train with that. Okay, hold on. Let's fast forward really quick. Yeah. How, do you know approximately how many drone flights you've had since then? No, because I saw something that you posted the other day. And I was like, <laughs> oh, thousand. I'm like, I'm sure I have at least two or three thousand. That's my I, guess. I don't have records like you because mm -hmm. I've got multiple TGI accounts. Yes. I've yeah. got work accounts, personal business accounts. Then I have training accounts when I set up for trainers. And then when I fly mapping, whether it's, you know, there's multiple drone mapping programs I use. That's not when me. you're flying, DJI doesn't log those. Uh -uh. So you, my students, and when I train commercial operations, they have flight logs, they have everything that they're doing. I've got it together piece by piece, like some in America, my team yeah. like, that I do because I have by project. So I could go through and pull all my Sargassum flights. And but you're like, I ain't got time for that. It's like, <laughs> I'm a diver too. Like I probably have 10,000 dives as a marine biologist and maybe about dive like a thousand, fifteen hundred. I stopped, stopped counting. counting. Yeah. Not even a thousand. I'd say like when I got to seven hundred, and I wish I kept going because that was, you know, twenty five <laughs> years ago. I would love yeah, to yeah. see and have records of what I saw. And mm. yeah, you got you got to track them. Okay, so maybe you track your flights. Do it, Christine. I make my new pilots do it because also it's for because I'm training people that want to fly commercially, professionally, usually right. for mapping, monitoring. So I always recommend you, you need to log your flights because that's like your, your resume. That's your, it's you, true. You, it shows how much experience I want to see projects, but I don't just mm -hmm. want to see like what you can do. I want to see your experience, how many flights you've flown, where you've flown, what altitude you've flown. So having good flight logs is extremely important, especially too, for liability and accidents, mm. you know, don't realize that's actually fascinating. The whole black box. You know, yeah. I, I go to countries and I find out from governments that like so-and-so crashed this drone. You know, most people don't realize that you can download and DJI can download mm -hmm, every mm -hmm. single stick control that that yeah. drone's ever done. You can't erase that yeah, you can. by just deleting the app. It's like mm -hmm. a plane. It's got yep. its black box. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can see what this is what I because I train somebody that's like their operations manager so they can see what all the pilots did. If some pilot comes in and crashed the drone, they can go back and see throughout the entire day, every single stick, punch, That's whatever. That's actually and, really and helpful because a lot of people 
don't know that. They don't know that all of their movements, all of their flights, all of their everything is being tracked. And I think that's important to call out and important to know. And also potentially fun and important to track one's flights, whether for fun or yeah. for what you're talking about in commercial purposes. Hey, I just want to interrupt and say, if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review. It really does help to distribute this to more people and make sure you connect with me and connect with Kim. All of her, her info and a lot of the resources that we've been talking about are in the show notes below. So make sure you check that out and let's move on. Let's let's start with the negative. I'm curious what one of your scariest flights has been. When and where was that? What was that like? I was in an island. Mm -hmm. It was a weekend. I was flying by myself. So recreational flying, not commercial flying. So no disclaimer there. Kim was just out testing a drone. So, but I was by myself with Phantom 4 Pro V2. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, it had some compass errors and I was having problems and I had hooked it. You know, DJI has all these firmwares and I'd done everything. And so I just went to test it to see, did this, you know, when you do the, um, the one you plug into your computer, I'm losing what it was called, um, the DJI thing. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. Um, you can firmware with just the app, but then it's also ah, called the assistant, DJI assistant. Okay. So that's what the firmware is really, your compass and, and things are really kind of on the fritz. It's You plug your com drone into your laptop, mm -hmm. hook it to the internet, and it runs a diagnostic on your drone. Mm -hmm. And we'll report that diagnostic straight to DJI as well, their surface. And then they can read that report and tell you to ship it in or maybe give you a patch or some sort of update. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like that next level before you have to, I know because I work internationally, before you have to <laughs> ship it. Yeah. So um, I decided just to test it after the firmware because you always want to test before you go out and do missions, you know. At a local so i put it up and i've never had this happen flying with my rc lost complete rc signal and the drone was like 10 feet from me hmm. and it lost signal turn it on and off i did Weird. everything i could yes to try to reconnect the drone unplug my phone powered everything and, and it's just hovering right there but it's just above my head so i try wow. to like grab it but i'm by myself yeah so i have nobody to hold the remote or whatever so i try oh. to grab it and then the drone goes up higher and I was like, because, you know, the obstacle avoidance. All, I was going to say, because oh. obstacle avoidance. <laughs> oh. So then I'm like trying everything. And so it's just hovering and it's kind of windy. It's by the beach. And there's like this old wall kind of behind it. And I was like, what the hell? Like, am I just going to have to like, like just sit here and wait till the battery runs out? And I was like, kind of like, what do I do? This is like literally, I've never had it just not on the fritz. Wow. The drone gone crazy. So I climb up, decide I don't have a choice. So I set the RC down. I climb up on a wall. So I don't know if you know how to do an emergency drone shut off. If the drone, this is something I train into. If the drone cannot shut down, like you mm -hmm. lose, there's a way that you can shut your drone off. So if you have your drone, here's your drone. If you take it from 60 or from here, 90, and you turn it 45 degree mm -hmm. angle really fast. Whoosh, yeah, emergency yeah. stop. So it's emergency basically flipping stop. your drone, turtling so it. I it will turn off. The wall. Ah, I understand what you're doing. Yep. Grab the P4P and whoosh, under yeah, yeah, yeah. it down. <laughs> and I land on the ground. This is like eight feet up. And I don't even drop the drone. And I was like, yes. I was totally by myself. And I'm looking around like if somebody had that on video, I would have gone viral on TikTok now. <laughs> It was so badass. I was so proud of myself. It was like, wow. Yeah. But again, I was just like really happy. I went back and I told my students the next day I was training and I was like, see, this is why you don't fly alone. <laughs> Kim, whatever. Kim breaks her own rules. I did it the other day too. Totally broke my own like, rules by like trying I, to X out my my SD card. I fly card alone by like ninety nine percent of my flights. Not commercially. Not oh yeah, not you're right, you're right, for right. them commercially because these mm -hmm. are organizations that are mapping, monitoring, right, and, and yeah. working. Uh, commercial. It's different, I guess, for me. Commercial we work have different would be audiences with cinematic stuff. When we're flying in teams. We're flying in teams, which looks really different. <laughs> That story is amazing. All right. So that was your worst recent flight, aside from your first, uh, your second one, rather. Well, it kind of um, shook me up a little because I thought, oh, my gosh, like, 
like I was kicking myself. Like, how am I going to get this drone? How am I going to get this drone? But it's that's just also why it's so important to know the different advanced safety settings, right? Like that's my favorite way. If you are having issues hand landing your drone on a boat, flipping it over, catching it and yeah. flipping it over is one of the fastest, quickest ways to get it safely out of the air uh, versus crash landing it onto the boat, which is what a lot of people do. And I hate hearing that. The Air 2S is a little sketchy. Sometimes. Yeah, no, it attacked my brother in Indonesia. Cut him up. <laughs> Hold on, let's, let's, let's talk about this. What do you mean? <laughs> I mean you you have him on for the story because I was like wishing I was recording it so I could show it to my students. It was the best story I've ever Did heard. Did he have obstacles? He's a badass. He, no. Yeah, no, there he, you go. That's why. Exactly. He didn't have obstacle ones. He's on a metal boat. He was taken off by the radar. And I'm like, this is the same yeah. joker that like he does, every, breaks every law. Like he's always the example in my classes of like what not to do. So he told me the story. Yeah. So he's on the front of the boat by the radar, mm. no obstacle avoidance. And then he didn't even know about the emergency shut off. I just told you yeah. about. And then it like, he said he was catching it and then it came back and he said it like, it was like a bird. It just kept coming back at his face and like, Chuck. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then he finally got it and like was able and it didn't break the drone. But I was like, dude, that's one of the top things people always tell me is um, that their drone will like jump into their face or do something crazy. And I'm like, you don't hand land a drone with obstacle avoidance on. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I see on boats that kills me is people who catch their drones over the water, that they lean over the side of the boat yeah. to catch the drone instead of letting the drone land in the middle and catch it in the middle of the boat in case something goes wrong. It can at least be in the boat. So or if it's you like, let go of it. I did it yesterday. I've watched so many people put their drones directly in the water. It pains me. And what's oh, funny well. is a lot of people are like, oh, well, drones are waterproof. And it's like, absolutely not. Well, There's I'm sorry. Wait, can I stop you here? Oh, well, there's underwater. I have, a, I have a little bone to pick with you, my girl. Oh, all right. Flying drones in the rain. Oh, flying drones. Oh, I'm all about it. Yeah, you have all these great <laughs> videos. And then my students are like, yeah, that girl, Christine, they get, they, well, she said, and I'm like, listen, mm -mm -mm -mm. you don't, you, you only watch the videos of Christine's that I tell you to watch. <laughs> I'm like, she, she tells you to do some stuff that no, you do not fly in rain guys. Oh my goodness. It's I never, love your tip. So it's never one water. where I say, Oh, it's raining. Let's send the drone. But I will say, Oh, here's an example in the Bahamas last week. There's a double rainbow, a double full rainbow. So full rainbow end to end. And it's a double and you can see the entire thing and it's raining. And I was like, I need it. I need it. I need one quick shot. And it wasn't raining that much. So I waited and I'm yeah. using the app, my radar, and I'm outside looking and I'm waiting for that pocket where there's a yeah. little bit less rain of exactly where I'm at. Send it, get the shot really quick, bring it down. It <laughs> really went straight up. Yeah, literally oh, just straight right. up. That's right. Okay. I said that's a little better. <laughs> it's like when you send it. But the way you say it when I watch you, you're like, send it. I'm like, send it. Oh, yeah. Well, there there are times I do just send it in the rain. But, I mean, it, it comes with risk. Okay, hold on. Let's talk about beautiful things because I just talked about something beautiful with that rainbow. Tell me about your best flight or one of the best things you've seen with your drones. Oh, wow. I've seen so many beautiful things. Because you fly islands a lot, yeah, which um, everybody is jealous of. <laughs> <gasps> yeah. I, I mean, gosh. I guess sometimes when I... I guess to narrow it down a little, I get really excited. I had one of these the other day. Um, when I'm flying my drone, um, I, again, I'm a marine biologist, and I'm trying to track marine life, so it's very hard to fly A over oceans with the glare and seeing your screen, I don't have a built-in screen because I can't use that for mapping. So I have mm. to use the iPhone and you're trying to get something, marine life. And so again, that's, as you know, requires a little patience, a little time, you're like scoping <laughs> around and you're not even sure until you get home and you look at videos. Mm. But um, so I was in La Jolla um, a week or two ago following a sea lion with a bait ball. Mm. And I was like, this is the best student training exercise. Because you don't fun. know which direction the bait ball is going to go. Yeah, It's like chasing it. So, And then it's always indifferent because they're all trying to avoid each other. Mm -hmm. And so I had it and I was trying to, with my sticks, very, so I ended up posting something. It was, I don't remember how long it was, but it was a pretty good, about, I think it went longer, over a minute. But I was able, over a minute period, 
to keep the, the, the sea lion and the bait. Nice. And, the and you know how hard that is. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. screen for Instagram. Which yeah. Is the center of the screen. <laughs> You know, it's I was I was so feeling cool. the same way it's about chasing out jet skis. Stuff, but you really have to be smart with when you're shooting, mm-hmm. and you know it's going to be used um, for posting because it, I love it, that. you know how. Yeah, so I was pumped when I got home and I looked at it because I was like, eh. I went down there just to see the leopard sharks because I heard it was a season. I want to mm-hmm. go out there swimming. And I was just nearby, but it was late afternoon, rough water, super glary, wind, not the right time. And I just, you know how it is, Christine. I'm out there. I'm talking to the lifeguards about best time to come because that's, again, one of my other tips, local knowledge. Uh-huh. Always do a site assessment and, like, talk to people about stuff. So I love to go down and scope before I actually fly I if I can. And it was amazing. And like I said, I wasn't even expecting it. And it's like, that's my other tip is, like, always just get out there and fly. You yeah. never know. People say, oh, we only fly at golden hour. No, screw that. Mm-mm. If it's cloudy, if it's rainy, if it just broke after a flood event is great. Before a mm-hmm. storm, the calm before the storm. Yes. Get out there. Get out there. Get as much practice. Fly every single day if you can, even if it's just one battery. When I first started learning, I'd fly with one battery every morning before I started work. Good for you. Up, go out there and just do skills practice. I you know, love that. I don't even fly a full battery. I would say so many of my flights are under five minutes because I'm just there to look, see if there's something interesting. And a lot of times there's just not. And so, you know, like I'll try to find something interesting, but I just can't. But I'll often just send it to look. And yeah. I don't know. You never know what you'll find. Sometimes you do find something really amazing. I travel a lot. So it's like I'm going to new places, you know, like I'm going in, in September to six islands and I've never been four of them before. So Mm -hmm. it's like, I will definitely be just looking online, looking on, you know, just drone anguilla drone tortola Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. have my list of sites before I even get there. Actually take us through that. What are the different ways that you location scout before you go figure out where to fly? So many. (laughs) My favorite location scout usually is local knowledge. I'm a people person. I specialize mm-hmm. in mapping local knowledge with drone imagery. So usually it is just talking to people when I go somewhere. Or even yesterday, I'm down in Torrey Pines and talking to somebody at the beach. Who, so just being friendly and talking to people. I think that's the number one funnest way to do it. Mm-hmm. The other is um, just Googling in mm-hmm. Google Images. Drone, wherever you're going. Yeah. Um, or same with the gram. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or Pinterest people use. But the other one I use is Google Earth. But yep. um, my favorite actually is not Google Earth. It's ArcGIS Earth because mm. it allows 3D view sheds and measurement tools, line of sight tools. How does someone tools. access ArcGIS? It's the same as Google Earth. It's online. It's a free download desktop mm. web app. So if you just go to ArcGIS um, Earth, yeah, you can download it. That's um, a new one for me. I'm well, so used you to just using changer. Google Satellite plus Google Earth and then all the inspiration yeah. from social media platforms. Actually, maybe this question might be a hard one uh, based off of the way you use drones. Mm-hmm. But what is there anything you're challenged with or anything that you're working on for drones these days? Yes, you're going to love this one. I'm ready. Tell me. <laughs> I- my personal challenge, because I always have a personal challenge. So oh, I'm ready for it. Challenge, which started last summer when I first met you, and it still is my personal challenge, is doing more drone photography, finding ways to, because drone imagery and drones are so, let's say, for mainstream sexy. Mm-hmm. And I'm an environmental manager. And what I've realized over the last few years working with drones is Everybody wants a piece of it. Everybody wants the training. People are really engaged with the drones. So it's really trying to expand my reach to more social media, to the wider audience. Mm -hmm. Because to me, I work a lot with governments. And sometimes we get frustrated as scientists because we're not seeing enough policy change. Mm -hmm. But where I think that the effective change is, is with normal people. 
And so mm. getting normal people to understand marine conservation solutions, problems, and getting them to engage and work with us through, I'm developing right now citizen science apps where I map sargassum seaweed in the Caribbean, where regular people, when they go on vacation or they live there, can take pictures. And it, it, it will feed back to my drone teams to know where to map, things like that. Mm -hmm. So really my personal challenge is doing more photography, videography, content creation, so I can get out to a wider audience and bring them in to understand the way that myself and my communities are using drones. Um, and it's really just been a game changer. I like almost want to cry sometimes in the last few Aww. months, the changes I've seen in these countries with drones and learning technology for sustainable agriculture, food production, climate change, sargassum, seaweed management. It's just, it's great. And to see the way these countries and the ministers and everybody is just like, this is going to absolutely yeah. revolutionize the speed in the, they're mapping, like we mapped in a few weeks time, you know, two or 3,000 acres of farmland, mm -hmm. people that never flew a drone before. Wow. You know, it was, and these are people that work in, farm, you know, agriculture, you know, food production, but for them, they said it's stuff that would take them, you know, maybe a year, what they got done in wow. a couple of weeks. Oh, I love that, Kim. Hell yeah. I'm training communities how to use drones to create 3D models of, you've seen the sargassum seaweed. It's all over the Caribbean. It's really, it's getting worse and worse and worse and longer and longer and longer every year, especially since 2018. And um, so I just finished a training class. And again, the overseas territories where I'm going right now, all these islands is to train more people to fly drones for sargassum mapping and management. And so why do we want to map it? We want to know how much is washing up on the beaches so we can figure out how to get rid of it. We're working with entrepreneurs to figure out, can we use it for biofuel or fertilizers? But they need to know how much market supply is there. So mm. using drones to quantify across the Caribbean, working with teams that they can map beaches and they can you know, interpolate how much is washing up on their shores. So we can understand over the year how much is coming in because these suppliers many times need it fresh. It can't be all dried and crispy. So we have wow. to get it as it's real time sensitive, which is again, why the drones can, in almost real time can be flying and mapping. Hold on, I'm curious. So if someone is fascinated by your story, cause I am, and they're interested in getting into the type of work with drones that you do, what would you recommend for them? A marine biologist, but really I'm a social scientist. Everybody will tell you I'm the people person. I just mm -hmm. connect everybody. I know a little bit about drones, a little bit about mapping, a little bit about this. And my job is just to get all of us to come together and work together. So I think whether you're a photographer or you're a content creator, there's a role that you could play in terms of environmental management. And like I said, either follow me to kind of get inspired um, or reach out to me if you want more information. I love that. Thanks for doing this with me, Kim. I appreciate yeah. it. Ooh, drones. They're so fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Drone Party with Kim. Make sure you connect with her, connect with me. And if you had some fun with us in this episode, make sure you cheers that like button and make sure you leave a review. It really does help to distribute this to more people. Go forth. Be amazing with your drone. I hope you found some inspiration and some helpful tips, and we will see you in the next episode. Ciao.